Zero to 100 is a podcast dedicated to bringing you quality conversations and insights on resiliency in physical, mental, social, and spiritual fitness through engaging discussions with those in the military and beyond. Hey folks, welcome to the Zero to 100 podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and with my co-host, Steve. Today we have two lamb, Ronan, uh, modern day samurai, former Green Beret, video game character in the Call of Duty game. I mean, this guy is, oh, and also a co-host of Forge by Fire TV show. He's done it all. And his story, his background even trumps all of his accolades and his resume. Boy, am I excited about this one. Steve, what are your thoughts? Like, what, what, what are you dying to ask him? Okay, Mark. Yeah, I tell you. So, well, I mean, I can't believe we're going to interview someone who has a character in a video game. I mean, how does this happen, <laughs> right? So my first question, Mark, how did, how did you get this interview set up? Because this is really, really kind of cool. Yeah, you know, that is truly a, uh, the best way I could say is it's, a, it's been a blessing, man, like a miracle almost, right? I heard his interview on the Vigilance Elite podcast, which I, I, which, which I like and I recommend our listeners to check it out. It's on YouTube and maybe uh, the other podcast uh, platforms. But the interview was so powerful. I shared it with my entire family, all my sons, and said, boys, you need to listen to this. This guy's story is better than any movie I've seen in recent years. And, and it's yeah. the fact that it's a true story is so inspiring. And so I thought, man, he'd be great to have on our show. But I don't know if he would have the availability I've reached out every now and then to some sort of well-known people and never got a reply. And, and to be fair, I think it's because it gets like lost in the inbox hell somewhere, right? Uh, of somebody's assistant or something because I'm responding to a, through a website. So I did that with him. I went to two uh, Ronin tactics. That's his website. And I submitted an inquiry and just told them what we do and said how I would love to have him as a guest. And he replied in a few days and said, I would love to. And I was just flabbergasted. I, I, I could not believe he was willing to do the show. In fact, he was enthusiastic. So that just, to me, it speaks more to his character. It, it, it's proof that what he said in that show really is kind of what he's living out, right? This guy wants to serve. He wants to impact others. And the first chance to do that right now with two unknown dudes, right? <laughs> Doing a podcast. <laughs> in right. the east coast he's like i'm down yeah. so man i'm excited i'm excited yeah yeah i tell you and i just got done listening to the podcast as well that you mentioned and man he has a ton to talk about when it comes to meaning and purpose um spiritual fitness and readiness um so i'm excited so you asked the question what do i look forward to asking him is really just to dive more into that that journey that he was on of how he came to really be at a place now in his life i think where he's truly spiritually ready and happy with where he's at so yeah looking forward to the conversation um so hey for our listeners uh we're gonna get right after it so welcome to the podcast and uh and what a great interview we have ahead of us well to lamb welcome to the studio sir what a privilege it is to have you with us on the zero to 100 podcast there's so much to say about your background and your credentials, but man, I'm going to tease those out and the website description on the podcast will have his resume and ways to contact him. But for now, let's just start with uh, kind of what you're doing now too. And we'll maybe we'll do this kind of going back and bring out the, the different ways in which you've been led to this path right now. So what do you do right now too? Oh, well, you know, I run a business with my wife, you know, uh, Ronin Tactics. We travel around the United States. We teach uh, law abiding citizens, law enforcement. In fact, we're going to uh, teach the Texas Rangers uh, pretty soon hmm. down in Dallas area. Um, working with a lot of those type of uh, law enforcement, uh, running the company, you know, the manufacturing and the distributions to the military. Uh, we we supply a lot of special operations units with our, our gear. Uh, I designed a lot of gear during my time in the military. I took a lot of my experience and I was able to uh, put that, you know, into business, you know, be able to engineer uh, and design it and then throw it into manufacturing and do we do our own marketing and distribution. Okay. 
So we run that. And then uh, I also, you know, we, we do a lot of public speaking these days. You know, I go around, yeah. and, um, talk to uh, a lot of veterans, you know, a lot of veterans that try to, um, you know, the war, the war years were hard for them. So yeah. we're just trying to, you know, try to help those guys out, push them along, uh, along with law enforcement. Uh, we we are filming, you know, in Hollywood, and then um, the next thing is NRA. You know, uh, we are, we are signed on as the ambassador of Spring oh. Armory. Yep. So okay. we're gonna be the new face of, of Spring yeah. Armory, and then um, they're going to announce that at the NRA show. So you know, okay, really exciting. Yeah. So that's a lot. Let me go back to what you're doing, with law enforcement. So I know there's a lot of folks like you who are, you know special forces types that come out and then they, they do that like consulting and they help with tactics. When you're working with SWAT teams or these special kind of law enforcement first responder types, they already have a lot of training. They already have a lot of programs in place. What do you guys offer that they don't have right now? Uh, experience. We offer a lot of experience. We offer intelligence. We offer the intelligence, understanding the environment, the situation, understanding penetration on, on the ground. Uh, so we understand ballistics at, at that level, um, but really a lot of experience. Uh, mm. So we bring in a lot, you know, for me, I've been to 27 countries. I've worked with 27 different commando type of units. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you. And the thing is that I'm able to bring that wealth of knowledge back to America. So if I look at an urban terrain or I look at a rural terrain or, you know, you know, I look at different type of mountain terrain, I look at funnel points, I look at all that, that, you know, maybe their experience didn't bring it to. So I bring yeah. that side to the house. I guess they're also always looking for that tactical edge, right? And so whatever <laughs> you can bring, I'm sure it helps. Yeah. And then, man, the gear, you said you're kind of, creating custom gear and you know offering it to military that that's that's no joke doing that like actually designing and then manufacturing something that that must have been like way outside your original your, your area of specialty right because like business i mean right because so how did that how did that like how were you able during, to pick that up yeah so during the war uh, especially my war years I, I took a lot of journals wrote down a lot of you know, just a lot of events, but a lot of daily events, along with that also a lot of equipment failures that I had. I was that guy who went into the rigger shed, you know, so I was in the uh, special missions unit where we employed our riggers in with us, you know, with the parachute capability in case we needed free fall in. But I was that guy that, you know, in between missions, I would learn from the riggers how to sew. Hmm. And so I would fix my gear and I would try to be inventive with, with certain process of how we breach the door and how you know so the gear sort of changing throughout the years and uh when i got out i was you know suffering through my depression and uh, i started going through my war journals you know and i have i have over 20 war journals you know just wow you know through the 27 countries and and drawings of places and you know and i uh, was flipping through and I, I realized this one night we were doing uh a raid in Baghdad and we had to climb. So we had the you know, high teams. So we would stack ladders and we'll bridge across buildings with night vision, so and so. The thing was that uh, we had a lot of equipment failure. The gun bell was one, you know, my gun bell was moving on me. There are sleepers on the rooftop. That means we had to move around these sleepers when they're sleeping. You know, um, there's weapons laying around, you know, the, uh, the upper, upper roof where we're we're landing and crossing mm. so i realized a lot of these equipment were moving and shifting on us as we're climbing mm. really that night i wrote down a note and i kind of roughed down a, an idea you know and then later on and this multiplied throughout different equipments free fall oh, okay know, i said hey this could be better so i started drawing different things so when i got out of the military uh, i started reviewing some of my notes uh i started drawing I got together uh, a group of engineers, be able to put that into a, a you know three D printing, right, and be able to put that in CAD and, and put it into some kind of laser cutting. You know, I knew like I started studying. You know, so that's one thing that we do in the military, right? We we understand our environment. So I didn't understand. Yeah. So I started studying the process and how things should be done, and you know the manual labor. How how do you even put it together? So we, 
we started doing that along with that, I started spearheading the training, you know, so that was able to help fund a lot of the initial research and development and everything else. Yeah. And then Hollywood, obviously. So I know you were on Forged by Fire, like three seasons. You know, the funny thing is I, my daughter and I love that show, but I saw the one that they, they have like different versions of those. And we saw the one that uh, had different hosts and they have like several judges. That's the one they're, they're cutting like pigs and other things. But you were in a different one, right? With uh, Goldberg, I think. Knife or Death is what we were on. Okay, um, Knife or Death. Yeah, so it's like a slightly different, yeah, they have several versions of the Forge by Fire. So are, are you still doing that or what's, what's up and coming for you? And then obviously you're in the Call of Duty video game, which I'll be honest, when I saw that on the title, I was like, I got to get this guy because uh, every Marine's going to be interested. <laughs> yeah. So what are you doing now with that? Oh, I mean, we, we just uh, recently filmed earlier this year in Hollywood. Um, they, Forged they, by Fire or? No, no, no. Uh, oh. In uh, Modern Warfare. So uh, Call of Duty. Oh, okay. So we're still working with that company to do a lot of my motion capture. So we just finish up that contract with them, all the gunfighting, all the martial arts, the sword, all, all, of, all of it, right? Yeah. So we did all that. Um, the History Channel, you know, we did three seasons and, you know, the show was was very popular. It, it was able to reach, I think they say 17 different countries. It's very popular. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was just ready to move on. You know, yeah. it's it's nice being in Hollywood. But I, sure. For me, um, you know, it's more than that. It's it's about giving back. You know, and yeah. uh, it took a lot of my time because uh, I had to run a company. I had to still train, and we were acting in Hollywood. So it was yeah trying to juggle that scale. Now we have now we're ambassador of Springfield, so we have to start filming commercials. We have to start okay. You know, what I mean, start doing all that stuff. With them. I, I really respect that about you too. So. When I, I, I listened to the four hour interview with Sean Ryan and I listened to other uh, sound bites that you've had, you know, that people put up with you on YouTube and you mentioned service and, and I know about the transition and that kind of became your new mission, right? And so I was like, let me reach out to his website. I bet it's gonna be some teenager who looks at the, the email and never even pass it to him. Yeah. So that's happened to me where I reached out to some known folks known figures that i never got a reply from so i was like I, I, nothing's gonna happen and you reply to me with your personal email i was like oh my goodness this guy's the real deal and you said you would love to so i just want to tell you that i've been just singing praises about you that man this guy he he's no kidding really about what he's saying and like i'm a fan and, and i'm a supporter so thank you like, for what you're doing like not beyond this show like that you're this you're an ambassador uh, of service and goodwill so that that's awesome thank you yeah so that's what you're doing now but man like there's so much in your story and looking back you mentioned your war journals that's a powerful thing to i guess look back on right uh, you get nostalgic where are you now in terms of because you know you struggle with pts and depression and kind of where are you at today like how do you you know what what What's the, what's the process looking like for you in terms of recovery and wellness? Well, you know, I want to go into how how did I even find like how did I even notice I was depressed? Right, yeah. I think that's what a lot of service members have issues. It's like, you know, they're going to hang on for one more day. They're going to hang on, one more, and that day turns into months and years and years and years and years, and then that mm. becomes who you are and body. How yeah. do you find out what it is? Yeah. You know, and, and for me, I, I'll tell you guys, you know, being on the special forces, it's very hard, even if you find out, because you'll deny it, you know, your ego, right? What yeah. makes you who you are, your ego is yeah. like, that's, that's <laughs> not true. So what I realized after service uh, was, look, I was really lost, you know, and for me, you know, I was heavily addicted to painkillers, you know, uh, I used it. Um, to mask my pain, not just physically, but mentally during the war. You know, we, we saw some stuff. And, you know, I was able to mask it, but after I got out of service, you know, I was spiraling out of control. Literally, yeah. I could feel my life spiraling out of control. And I was repeating the same things over and over every day, hoping for change, huh. right? Repeating the same, same addiction. Yeah repeating the same yeah. story, hoping praying to god for change yeah i look when i say god 
my my relationship with God, you know, was almost non-existent as a child because I wasn't introduced to that. I was what I was raised in around. I was raised around my mother was Buddhist, and I was raised around that. And you know, the way of you know Zazen, Confucius. I was raised around Taoism and all this. Mm-hmm. Right, but the thing was, I wasn't connected to the higher power yet. Yeah, and yeah. you know, even during my time in service, I hate to say I wasn't connected to the higher power. You know, I I fought for compassion. I fought because that became, you know, my upbringing in in Confucianism and in Taoism. You know, I believe in in harmony with the universe. I believe in what's good and what's evil. And I believe in if we want the better, the world be a better place. It starts with you, right? Which is uh, which is Confucius. But I never had God. You know, I had purpose. Yeah. So when I was spiraling out of control, man, literally when I was out in the military, I was spiraling out of control. I was heavily addicted to drugs. I was just so one day uh, I, I would sleep all day. You know, mm. day. You know and this I, is like the sleeping all day was as soon as you got out, right after retiring. Yeah, I was spiraling out of control even when I was in service. Okay, like the tail end of your career, right? Yeah, yeah, and I just really didn't under. I didn't fit in anymore. I just didn't, I wanted to be isolated. Um, I hated myself, right? And I expressed it, right? Yeah. Well, in special forces, it's all about that. You know, yeah. You're, you're living in that. You're living in, in, you know, in aggression. You're living in fire. You're living in that hate, you know? Yeah. So when when you're training in raids and ambushes, every, CQB every, every day, you're exposed yeah. to in in the teachings of the five rings it's called fire the teachings of yeah fire. um so i was really spiraling out of control and i look the only weapon i had that worked for me in the military was fire mm. fire right yeah. fire encompass hate fire encompass you know judgment fire because i had to be that you know we were the guys that kicked open the door and in 0.5 a second i decide life or death yeah you know, yeah. you're a threat or not and look guys that's that comes with a heavy burden you know yeah. and i was spiraling out of control and that the only energy that i had was strong was fire right so i hate it yeah hey, Mark, you got me, something yeah let me jump in right real quick here um you know uh too i shared with you uh i know before we started this interview a graphic right um and that's the spiritual fitness uh model for the marine corps and uh hopefully through the magic of uh, technology we can put this up on the screen uh, during our podcast but at the end of it there's seven seven questions and this is seven questions that we ask marines to be thinking about in regards to how spiritually fit they are so i want to ask them of you right now because this is a perfect spot so if you think to where you were at right in that time frame before you um found that source of uh you know connectedness to God, um, which then helped you to then kind of boosted you into kind of a better place of resiliency. Um, I'm going to ask you these seven things. So number one, how respectful were you of your, of others and around you um, on a scale of like, yeah, I was doing great to, I was doing terrible. Towards the end of my career? Right in that time spot that you were just talking about, right. When towards the end of your career and then coming out of that, being able to be respectful of others and of yourself. You know, everything revolved around me. Mm-hmm. The universe revolved around me, you yeah. know? So I didn't respect anybody. Yeah. Okay. Number two, um, able to make sound moral decisions. How are you doing in that? None. None? Okay. I would choose the, uh, I would choose what is bad, I feel, you know, yeah. now. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, well, not good at that time, but uh, third question, um, a strong sense of hope about life in the future. There is no hope. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then number uh, four, the ability to feel forgiven and forgive others and forgive self and others. No. No. Okay. And then engaged with family and friends, the, that social connection. No, I was isolating myself. Okay. And then number four, engaged with core values and beliefs. I didn't have any. Yeah. 
So, so Mark, uh, you, that's right there, um, a scale that we've developed for the Marine Corps um, to be just looking at how am I doing spiritually. And so it's, it's, uh, so it sounds like for you to, at that place in your life, you came to a realization, hey, I'm rock bottom, I'm having depression, I'm dealing with all these things. And then something switched for you to begin a journey. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Mark, uh, and two, to kind of continue that story. So two, you know, those questions we give to Marines and say, this is a way to kind of look at as a mirror, right? And I always use the term, it's a mirror to your inner life, right? We use, we use other devices to check our uniform, we check our gear, but how do you check the state of your inner life, right? And so those questions kind of uh, at least depict that. And it's interesting, you said you were pretty much at the bottom of all of them. Right now, I, basically, I bet you're probably high on a lot of those, right? still working yeah you know i you know i want to say this i'm very samurai in the way i live my life i'm very observant and i write down a lot of journals and and i i i i'm in harmony with the universe is what i say but at that time i was not in harmony with myself yeah you know and the only thing that was pushed me along was what kept me alive and more which was hate discipline Right. So I had certain core values in the military that that kept me going. Right. Because I, I felt like looking back at that time, look, it, it was very hard for us. You know, when I say for us, my family, you know, my wife. And the thing was, I isolated myself and she was, you know, she's this big time, you know, uh, business person, master's degree, you know, just really successful in life. Mm. She was working up in Denver and, uh, you know, big, big time, you know, corporation. And, and I, you know, I tell you, for me, 23 years, I was laying in bed all day, you know, and I was, I was, you know, on drugs. Anytime I would wake up, I would, you know, I don't want to feel normal. So I'll pop another pill. Right. And I never, and I was spiraling out of control. And I knew it, like, I was telling myself, I know I was spiraling out of control. And I'm reading, you know, I'm reading these statistics of these veterans and they're dying every day of overdose. Yeah. Right. It just didn't matter. I didn't care. Yeah. I was sparring yeah. out of control and, you know, I was sleeping all day. And then, you know, I was, I remember this really bad day, you know, I was having anxieties, uh, depression, and I was, the noise was very loud that day. You know, when people say, what's that noise? Noise is your subconscious talking to you over and over. It's like, you know, a song playing in the background. And in time, that song, you kind of, you know, you forget about it, right? You forget about it because you get really busy. The war years were very busy for me. And then that noise now, now that I'm sitting in stillness, that noise is so loud. And I'll pop a pill and then the noise will calm down. But anyways, he started getting really bad where I, you know, I knew like if I pop more pills, I'm going to die. You know, like yeah. I know this. Right. So uh, I was sitting at the house and uh, it was completely dark and I was watching TV that was off. I don't know how many hours I was there. Just staring at this TV and just, the noise was so loud. And when I say the noise is, you know, guys have been to 27 countries. You know, I live with the people. It's not like, you know, we go, yes, in commandos, we go out, hit a target, we'll come back to the green zone. But in the green berets, we will live with the people. We'll fight with the people. You know what I mean? So you're exposed to, I mean, just the worst in humanity. Mm. You know, for me, it was 15 years of it. 23 years of serve, 15 years of war in special operations and, you know, at JSOC level. And, and I tell you, man, it, it, I heard the world. Mm. and I don't know like something it was so loud yeah voice said get up it was so loud this voice I can't even describe it this energy is get up so I did and I don't know man it's just something I walked around my house and sometime, somehow I, it led me to this room and in this room, there's 27 countries, books, books all the way back to when I was nine years old. 
13 years old, I'm learning the, the, the art of Bushido and the, the way of a warrior, you know, Confucius and, you know, Alan Watts, all these books and philosophy, everything, war, everything in this book. So imagine hundreds of books in this room. And I stood in front of a bookcase and I pulled out one book. And, you know, I, when I say a spirit, I pulled out this book, not knowing what it, it was just a random pull. And it was uh, Dakudo by uh, Miyamoto Masashi, The Book of Five Rings. It was his last book, uh, The Way of Walking Alone. And in, in this book, he talks about, you know, everything exists, all your love, all your compassion, everything exists. Everything exists within you. Look nowhere else. You know, man, I, I was looking for the answers everywhere else. You know, pills, my wife, you know, my teammates, I would call them. And, and, and the answer is within me. So I realized that at that moment. I found that energy when I was, uh, gosh, man, when I was 11 years old. You know, my, my uncle asked me if I wanted to be a commando. You know, I was getting picked on, I was spit on, I was, you know. And it, what this means is you have a choice. When you're lost and you're in that really dark place, the dark night is what some people call it when mm -hmm. you go visits. Yeah. A choice. So I, I, I literally had an energy right you ever felt rage in yourself where you really don't like yourself well i i had that so i i quickly understood the power of that energy of hate because i i used it in war so i ran upstairs grabbed all the pills and dumped it probably one of the worst things i ever did right because i was on some of these painkillers or i was on the painkillers for seven years so imagine I already heard these voices, you know, and, and when I say painkillers, I was taking antidepressants, I was taking Ambien, I was taking Adderall, I was taking all these, and I didn't care. So I dumped him, I suffered. My, uh, my body ached, I was having chills, I was vomiting. Well, it's like regular withdrawal from any other drug, huh? Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, uh, I, there was, you know, in special forces, I, I visit monks, you know, all through the world, monks from European monks to Asian, you know, all through Asia. And I remember this Tibetan monk told me, you know, if you want to change, it begins with you. And I remember when I was, I was 24 years old and, you know, I was coming out of the Philippines. We lost some teammates there. And I, I asked the monk. And he said, if you want to get to know yourself, if you want to get to know me, would you not sit with me every day? Then if you lose yourself, why not sit with yourself and get to know yourself again? You know, back then I was like, what the hell are you talking about, right? But <laughs> now, now I'm, I'm thinking I'm sitting in this dark space. Get to know yourself again. So I did. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a schedule because discipline, look guys, discipline is what, what, what made us great in the military and the Marines and any, anything, right? Mil our discipline, our level of discipline. So I wrote down four o'clock in the morning, you're going to get up. You're not going to sleep anymore. So four o'clock in the morning, I was sitting in my dark deck, shivering, vomiting, mm -hmm. trying to understand what it means to be mindful again. And I tell you, I sat there, I sat for three years and I fell, right? And you know, when I say for three years, during this time I was filming for the History Channel, my business is, I mean, it's, it's, it's very successful, right? I was, you know, well known in the tactical industry. What I'm saying was fame and money won't bring you happiness. Mm. That's right, yeah. I was growing, I was growing his success and fame so fast. And here I am sitting in the deck. Yeah. Try to be happy. There's the external world and then the inner world, right? And yeah. <laughs> the external yeah. world was blown up. But the inner well, world that's why people don't, 
that's what people don't understand is that when they see a successful person, there's a lot of pain and suffering and, and failures that, that comes along with that. You know what I mean? But there's a choice. There's a decision that you made. So here I am. I made this decision. I'm going to be better. So here I'm vomiting. And, you know, I'm, and when the sun comes up, I'm like, okay, I got to be grateful. <laughs> Thank you, God, for this day. Never meant any of it. And then I would, I would go into physical training, right? And I, I, would, I would destroy my body. And then I'll go to work and I'm successful. In many years, I repeated this movement. I was moving forward. Trust me, I was moving forward, but I, I wasn't, I didn't have the key ingredient yet. And then uh, I, I think I, we just got on uh, Call of Duty, right? And everything's blown up more. And, you know, now I'm in this, I'm, I'm, I'm global, right? Basically. Yeah. I'm global. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this? You're rising at that level so fast and you don't even have your shit together. <laughs> That's scary. That's a scary place to be. Yeah, I was still so like hurt from my military career. Hmm. You know, I was still suffering from, you know, losing my teammates. I was still trying to just, man, I was just trying to get on my feet again. But here I am. To stand in front of all these people, and so I'm throwing throwing a mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and everybody's like, "Oh man, you you have to be so badass." And you know, here I am. I'm I'm breaking down inside. Mm. Yeah. So I'm sitting. I'm sitting. I'm sitting. And around three years, I, I started hearing birds. I don't know why it clued me in that day. Mm. But I heard birds. And then I, I, I looked at the sun and it was coming up. I'm like, wow, that's kind of pretty. What I'm saying was that I was starting to find myself again, right? Because we lose yeah. ourselves. We lose our true self. Yeah. If you study that, we and lose the true self of who we are. And I was finding what is my truth again. So I sat. Yeah. Right. And, you know, fast forward at another year, four years now into meditation practice. Man, I, I was still suffering, man. And um, Tony Robbins, I remember that, you know, mm -hmm. that seminar came up online. And uh, I asked my wife, I'm like, hey, I, I would love to take four days and, and really work on myself. Because I was, I was getting better, but I wasn't really fulfilled, right? Yeah. I wasn't happy. And um, so she let me go to Tony Robbins, 13 hours sessions right it, it, like you're wow working. you're working so okay i want to explain to you tony robbins right number number i i have an ego right i'm a green beret i'm you know, <laughs> you know the world labels you know spec ops guys badass so you have you're living up to this expectations of the world yeah right man it's so heavy yeah what the world you know what the command and special operations rely on i mean man you're you're the cutting edge and reputation is everything everything you know and uh and i'll tell you i wasn't that great towards the end you know i was messing up so what i did was um during that time i realized that and uh i started working on myself you know and uh every day and uh tony robbins uh came up and uh, i took advantage of it and what came out of that was faith yeah it was so yeah yeah you know that's if you can tie the thread for us so i know some of the key insights you shared about the tony robbins experience uh, based on your other interviews and people can amplify your story through that as well but i like to know for us for our listeners how did that connect you to like a very specific faith are you christian catholic or as you mentioned the cross in your office and your, you know, and your breathing techniques as well. If you could just share that connection. Yeah, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in internal spirit. I believe in God. I believe in a creator. I believe that we're all connected. You know, we're all connected in this world and uh, we're put in this world to learn our lesson, to learn experience, you know. So I mean, how did the Tony Robbins experience lead you there? 
You know, I was praying to God a okay. lot, every day. And I would embrace what is gratitude. And, but I don't think I really meant it. Right? I think I was just using it as, okay, everybody's saying this is a method, so I'm just going to do it. But I didn't really mean it. Right? And then when I came out of that, well, when I came into that seminar, he, he'll make you do some, some crazy stuff, right? He'll, he'll change your uh, behavior, by, uh, uh, behavior as in you'll dance around, you'll jump up just really outside my comfort zone, <laughs> you know, commando, right? So I'm dancing, yeah. shaking, I'm screaming at the top because I'm really trying to make this work. Yeah. And uh, he, he changes your physiology and your mind and body and this and that. And then he, go, he went into spirituality at a certain point. And he said, look, guys, he goes, if you guys are really successful and you're really sad and depressed, and that's ultimate failure. And I'm like, God, oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you know, you work your ass off. You're famous. You got money. You're fucking depressed. That means that's the ultimate lose. I'm like, oh, God, I'm <laughs> right. And I'm jumping up and down. Yeah. And he said, what made you successful was significance. And he broke down moral value, significance. What made you successful? And, and, and the thing was, look, guys, Marines, Army, whatever, whatever. If you are the top of whatever that branch, mm. right, you have to have a high standard. Yeah. You have to have a standard above everybody else. You have to have this uncontrollable discipline. And I had that, you know, I had that because I was picked on as a child. I was, I was told I couldn't. So I rose up to be this warrior. But the thing was, it drove everything with significance. My training, everything, my, you know, my status, right? Who I was, the title, man. And, and it built up into this point where that's my expectations of myself. I lost myself. That's not who I am. Mm -hmm. Green Beret, oh, the military, that's not who I am. That's, that was part of my path, but I lost myself in that path. Who's my true self? And I, I realized if you connect with a higher power, right? If you connect with that energy and I, I truly connect with it now, I feel it. I feel it. I feel a connection, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think like to start, if people say, how do I start? How do I start? Man, you start by just sitting with yourself. I promise you. Mm. if you sit in meditation right i don't care what religious you are if you just sit with yourself in meditation and you quiet down that noise of the world right and you sit with yourself and you you just focus in on the inhale and the exhale but the exhale more on the pain right on the exhale through the dom you'll feel the pain and the stress exiting out of your body so that's called calmness right you're calming your body grounding yourself and look, man, we don't ground ourselves enough in, 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 in the military or even in life as civilian. We don't ground ourselves because yeah. we don't understand the process of grounding. And, I, and when I started grounding myself, I tell you, God is, God is within us. He's everywhere with this energy. It's everywhere. We're, we're all one. Yeah, I love right. what you There's said about sitting with yourself that's a such a simple thing and it is potentially one of the hardest things for driven americans to do we're busy we feel a sense of success because of our busyness and it becomes our identity like you said so performance orientation right it becomes completely blinding and because we never sit, we don't know ourselves, we don't know the people we care about and we love, and eventually we find ourselves as a stranded island in an unknown place. And man, what a powerful picture. With that, I think we're coming to the end of our first segment, but yeah, man, there's so much, are. and I'm excited for the next segments. Listeners, I hope you come back because this is just this is just scratching the surface of two story, and we will jump back into. How he became a samurai. What was the origin story? Just like the Marvel comics, we're going to go back in time and give you the prequel. Hey, Mark, as we uh, wrap up this session, I just want to highlight two things that I heard to say during this time. And 
And one was that he was in a place where he realized he just had to get up and make a choice, right? Make the choice to get up and, and do something. And he did. Um, and then secondly, that powerful statement to just be able to sit with yourself to get to know yourself. And those are two hugely important things. And I want to just say that to our listeners right now, that if you're in a spot where you just find yourself, oh, man, I'm in pain. I don't know what's going on. Number one, you're willing to make a choice right now to get up and make a change, right? And if you don't know who to talk to, find somebody to talk to, uh, if that's your local chaplain, if that's a mentor, a leader, a family member. Um, but then also be willing to get to know yourself. Um, and I just want to share a personal note. As I was driving this morning, I won't go into the story, but I just, I faced some difficulty this morning um, and I was just driving down the road and I was talking to, to the Lord and I was just like, okay, what is going on here? Why am I facing these difficulties? And then there was a gentleman on the side of the road and he was asking for money. And I said, man, that's easy. That is so easy. I pulled out my wallet and I handed some money. I said, hey, God bless you. He said, God bless you. And I tell you what, that exchange right there made my morning. And it was like, it, it was just, it was just that simple thing of being willing to sit with myself as I was driving, contemplating things, and then to be able to help others. And so um, with that, we're going to wrap this session up. And um, wow, yeah, I'm excited for the next uh, half hour. So listeners, join us on the next segment. And uh, as we continue the conversation with Tulam. Hey, folks, welcome back to segment two with uh, Call of Duty character Ronan and retired Green Beret and just uh, TV personality uh, extraordinaire uh, to Lamb here. Uh, today, we go back to the beginning story. So how does to Lamb, and I, I know there's even a Vietnamese pronunciation that I'm going to ask you to do later, right? So that's part of your story, like the Americanization, right? Uh, of your name your identity, but also through that, your, your finding of the samurai path, right? So let's get into, so you're born in Vietnam. And I remember hearing that your mom had to shield you from mortars coming to the hospital or something. So take us back to that time. What year was it? And what, what conditions were you born into? Yeah, at that time during the Vietnam War, Vi you know, the Americans left Vietnam, you know, um, they they pulled out of Vietnam, no more involvement. Uh, I was born on the losing side of that war. I was born in South Vietnam, right? So, you know, the North Vietnamese uh, at the morning of my birth, they surrounded that city of Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh City. Um, so basically they were, I mean, think about what you see in, you know, Ukraine right now, right? They're, they're hitting with artillery fire, they're softening that target. So, you know, that was, what the conditions I was born on because uh, three months after my birth, you know, we lost our freedoms to communism, right? They, you know, um, Black April, they, you know, they rammed their uh, tanks through our, our gates. They, they came in with troops uh, and then they submitted us to oppression. You know, when I say that is they didn't want to uprise it again. They didn't want uh, more wars with, um, with, you know, guerrilla tactics and, and everything else. They didn't want to resist it. So they sent out anybody with military experience, especially working with the Americans to re-education camps. You know, um, these were torture camps. These, you know, a lot of people died in these, these camps. We escaped genocide, you know, on a overstuffed wooden fishing boat. We were stranded at sea for 30 days. You know, uh, by the grace of God, we were, we were saved by a Russian supply boat, and then we lived in the refugee camps for a year and a half, waiting on, you know, our citizenship uh, paperwork to go through for that process to even start for us to be Americans. You know, so what, what I'm painting is, you know, America is kind of built on these conditions. You know, maybe maybe not in, in your generation or what, but it was built on these conditions, your, your, your forefathers, our forefathers, Americans, we, we face this oppression, you know, um, how, why did we even come to this country? You know, promise of a new land, freedoms, right? So that's what my mother was holding on to was freedom. So we came here, uh, I could tell you the Vietnam War is very unpopular, you know, um, it was a very unpopular war in history. Um, so I was the face of this. Um, they didn't, 
You know, a lot of Westerners, they don't know the difference between North Vietnam or South Vietnam. They don't even care. It's it's not that. It's it's about controlling a person, right? Bullying a person. And that was magnified through teachers and and my classmates and even their parents, because their parents were racist. It was racist times in America. She, a lot of people are like, really, was that racist? It's still racist today, <laughs> right? So imagine right after Vietnam War, like really think about it, guys, right? So look, you know, uh, we were very poor when we first came here, you know, very poor. And, you know, I was, I was reminding every day how poor I was. I'm painting this picture because this was the seed for Bushido, how I found the way to wear it. And I was picked on and all this. And, um, you know, there was an incident, sub two teacher day where, you know. Dude, was, I'm sorry, but man, we can't skip through your, <laughs> that escape from Vietnam without at least a couple of probing thoughts because that was a, like a, an epic trip, right? Because I know you guys like escape near death experiences. And so if you could summarize, right? I, I know you don't remember much, but you were young and you probably heard a lot of these stories to your mom and your brother, but. What what do they carry with them uh, in terms of memories? Uh, did, did they, is it something they remember as like, that made me better, that made me stronger? Or man, there's so much trauma there that I, I still got baggage. Like, how is it affecting them today? And, and how is it affecting you, like the memory of that time? No, they, they didn't get over it. They're still stuck in trauma. You know, and I'm like, I learn on, you know, but she, she still struggles with loss and, you know, and not everybody has the skills to get over that level of trauma. You're not going to get over that level of trauma. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, if you ask about me, you know, later on in life, you know, I have to start studying the Green Berets, you know, look, one of the things that we have to get assessed for was our level of intelligence, right? You have to be a very intelligent guy to be a Green Beret because we have to be able to research a lot, you know, in countries and so I, I was studying how the mind and body is connected, right? And how the brain is developed and, you know, how our primitive brain thinks about survival. And this, I was really diving in, you know, I was that guy, if, you know, at five o'clock in the morning running on a treadmill, listening to some doctor talk about this. I was starting mm -hmm. studying and researching many hours. And what I found, you know, is, you know, our analytical brain is not even developed into seven to nine years old. So, you know, for a child, everything goes straight into their subconscious without thought, without rationalization. So what I experienced during that time was, you know, murder, you know, rape, uh, oppression, you know, I, I, uh, dying, people were dying at sea, you know, people that died at sea got thrown overboard. I was seeing this, you know, my brother, you know, uh, we would go and, and, and uh, scavenge for firewood in the refugee camps. We would see dead bodies laying in these camps. You know, it was desperate survival situations. So, you know, as a child, you know, I, I didn't think that affected me because I didn't remember, really recall too much of it. But if you study the brain, trauma is trauma and that's bed in your brain, right? It's just, you can't go back that far. But if you meditate, actually you can Right. So the thing was, I, I, I was studying all this and that's what I faced with, you know, and then, you know, growing up in 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 Fayetteville, North Carolina, a very highly populated military town, a lot of different ethnicities. You know, we were raised in a poor part of town. That's what we you know had. So I was picked on. I, I saw racism at the at that level. So I wanted I wanted to bring you. I, I was sub to teacher day, worst day, because my name is pronounced Du Dung Lam, you know, it's Vietnamese name. This this persistent teacher trying to pronounce my name, it 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 influenced the class to make fun of me. They they made fun of me any, every every day, anyways, but it was really bad this day. And then I was sent down to principal's office. I was reminded again how much I didn't really belong here in this country. But here was the seed for change. You know, my my uh, my father and mother eventually got divorced. You know, it was look, it was very hard times, right? And then uh, I moved in with my future stepfather, American Special Forces Supreme Beret. He was a drill sergeant. He taught me discipline, but I struggled with a lot of that discipline. I had I had zero discipline, right? And now I'm waking up at four o'clock in the morning, making my bed to like boot camp standards. You know, he was a drill sergeant. And I would raise my hand, you know, I put my hand over my heart when I raised the flag, you know, and I didn't understand any of it. 
fact, I never asked for any of this. And if, so speaking of your stepdad, drill instructor, I, mean, that, I love that story. I cracked up when I heard that, man, that you're still making your bed. You got to drop a coin. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of the McCraven speech, right? Make your bed. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, Admiral McCraven, right? When he was speaking at uh, A&M, yeah. that that was a secret to his success. Make your bed. <laughs> he did it in private school. He did it in the military. And it sets the tone for everything. It's, it's, it's everything because it's the little things. It's the little things that mounts up to everything. If you don't know what's right and wrong, if a bed's not made and you look at it, if it's that's right, then that's everything. It's not right. You know, and that's the level of discipline I was raised in. Look, yeah. every person eats their own, right? I'm not judging anybody. That's the level I was raised in. I really had a hard time. So here was the samurai story, right? So, you know, a year uh, after my parents kind of separated and I didn't hear from my father, you know, and my mother came in with a cardboard box. She, she gave it to me. She said, this is from your, your, your father. Um, you know, later on that night, I opened up the box and within the contents of this box was four VHS tapes. It was dubbed VHS tapes with Vietnamese uh, written on it. I, I didn't. A lot of, so explain what VHS is to our younger audiences. <laughs> <laughs> well, before the, We're dating the, ourselves here. <laughs> before the uh, media streaming days and then the DVD and blockbuster days, right? We had what was called VCR, right? And anyways, it was, uh, it was a VCR tape, right? And I threw it in there. It was dub tapes and it was uh, the Art of Budo. You know, it was the combat side of being samurai. It was the the essence of the Eido, the way of sword and mind, and Bushido, the path of warrior, you know, and how that's broken down to education, discipline. It was a very strict life. And it 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 the biggest thing that that really drew me was the samurai, right? He was just so precision in calmness, right? And I remember, I remember seeing that, and then, and then, and then the Bushido code to help others, right? To 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 live a life of purpose rather than just existence, right? That's Bushido. Yeah. Readily die for, you know, to readily die, really. Um, Bushido, like wow, you know. So that really drew me, and I I remember watching that through and over and over and over, like literally hundreds of times. The other, the other three tapes were Bruce Lee tapes, right? It was hmm. the dragon. It was, and I, I remember this. I want to tell you, you know, Enter the Dragon. Bruce Lee took out this student. And they were walking along this garden. It was brilliant. And he's like, it's like a finger pointing at the moon. And then he said, and then the student looked and he slapped. And he goes, "Don't concentrate on the finger, or you, you know, or you, you lose all the heavenly glory." Right, so I, I grew up to a lot of these philosophies, you know, that's very Buddhist if, if you don't. Yeah, so going back to that, the tapes, why did your dad send you those? Was it just like a gift or stuff that was laying around in his garage? He's like, here, but, you know, he might appreciate these. What was the intent, do you know? I don't think it was laying in his garage because we didn't have anything. So that was, you know, we didn't have anything. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't know why. He never said why. anything about it. I never talked to him again. Mm, wow. The last but time it was uh, fortuitous. You know, I saw him ever again. You know? mm. That's pretty pretty amazing. That is like the last thing you got from him, right? I guess, like in terms of something he passed on. And then. Well, you know, this is the way I feel things now being a Ronin. I, I feel like the universe uh, gives us signs and is either of your attention. Do, are you, can you pay attention? Right. To the, to the signs, and then this sign will lead you to purpose, right? And we lose our identity through our lives because we forget our childhood self. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, okay, so picked on, I was bullied, and then I had the image, a seed planted in me that... Yeah, through the Bushido tape? Matter. It doesn't matter the conditions or circumstances. You know, a warrior chooses this. He chooses the highest mountain. He chooses the steepest path, right? Because through this suffering comes understanding. Yeah. Can you imagine learning that at nine years old? Did you, do you imagine do you know just having that in your mind <laughs> at nine years old? Like yeah. how far you can, right? 
So I just didn't have a direction yet. I knew I wanted something, but I didn't have a, a bearing, you know, my compass, where do I want to be? Right. And, you know, Masashi says, you know, the way, which is the way is an effortless path in life to flow with the, the natural flows of the universe and God. And, you know, the way can be found in all things. And so 11 years old, you know, if you, you can see this through my past interviews. My uncle asked me a question. Do I want to be a commando? I was, I was really going through hard times. And I realized at that age, because I was adopted into the special forces, my, my stepfather, special forces, right? So, he was going down to South and Central America fighting, you know, during the drug wars years, the Ronald Reagan years. So I knew what the mission was. And then I knew my uncle asked me, do I want to be a commando? My mother taught me compassion. You know, my mother taught me compassion because she was raised in that Buddhist Confucius, right? Confucianism, right? Think about it. So she was raised around that. So I, as a young child, you know, prayed honor to my ancestors. You know, I did a lot of the Asian type of cultures, you know? So I was raised around Confucianism and Taoism. That's why you see me talking about it. And I, I, there's a reason why I'm saying all this, right? Because it helped me heal later with God. You know, so, you know, my mother taught me all this. I was disciplined as a, as a boy because I had a regimented schedule, right? Getting up at four o'clock in the morning. I had patriotism, you know, I lost everything. So I, not, I you know, I, I love America because I took a snapshot of America as not being American, right? So I knew what freedoms was. So as I was developing as a young boy with the mindset at nine to there's, there's a higher path, a warrior, you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be, I just didn't know what it, what it is yet with the, yeah, yeah, bearing, right, and then, uh, I don't know, man, you know, my, my uncle asked me, and my, my mother raised around that livelihood, I realized that the oppressor of the Brer means, literally translator, it means from oppressed man to free man, you know, that was our motto in the special forces, to free the oppressed, yeah, that's in your kind of logo too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was born in that condition. The Green Berets and Navy SEALs were developed by John F. Kennedy to combat insurgency. You know, so I was born in that environment. I was, I was raised in that environment. I was, if you could say like I was born in war and raised to be a warrior, yeah. I could not forge it anymore, you know? Yes. And, and, and to be beat down and told you're not, you're, you're not welcomed you know, you spit on. So that taught me, I'm willing to fight for the people that can't fight for themselves. Yeah, so for our listeners that don't know some of the context here, Tu's uh, uncle, who I think sponsored you, right, and your family to immigrate to the US as refugees, he is also a Green Beret officer and who was a combat veteran as well. And then his stepdad is a drill sergeant, Green Beret. So you were surrounded. And he was in Fayetteville, uh, or Fayetteville, as we call it sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is the home of uh, Army Special Forces, JSOC, and a lot of other right uh, special forces entities. And so half the people probably in that, that town was <laughs> something related to special forces. Yes. So you were like steeped yeah. in that culture. And then the Bushido tapes arrive. And... It's this everything just makes sense, right? Like this, you've been chosen <laughs> and you've been groomed, uh, whether you knew it or not, forged by war, adversity, and this path makes the most sense. Like that light bulb kind of went off at nine, huh? Yeah. And I knew samurai meant to serve. So how do you serve? You serve God, you serve country, right? That was more of a, a model, right? I didn't really understand the roots of that yet. God and country. I always said that, right? When I because I was raised around that patriotism. Mm. But man, it was through the years is what I, I felt I learned what country meant. Yeah. Mm. Then when I fail, when I lost my way, that's God, right? So now I have a really deep understanding on, on, on what that meant. Mm. To serve God and country. And as a samurai, one who serves, I serve my God and my country. And I replicated uh, what my mother taught me in compassion by my willingness to fight for the oppressed.
you know, because those were conditions I came out of, you know. So that's why I consider, you know, and it towards the end when I lost my way, you know, I, I was very ashamed of myself, you know, so that's why I call yeah. myself a Ronin towards the end. But Ronin took on a, a different, took on a different meaning to me than uh, dishonorable, right? It took on courage because I had to have courage to move past, to be better, right? I wanted to be better and I didn't understand how to be better in this next evolution of my life, which is Savannah. I, did, I was a warrior. You know, I don't yeah. know. You know, since a child, I didn't, you know, a I didn't warrior know. without a war, a warrior with a war inside, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you're looking for a war, you need a war, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I would tell you this, I would let you know this as a, as a young child looking back now, 18 years old, paratrooper, and then I went to the long range reconnaissance teams. You know, I went through your amphibious reconnaissance school at Fort Story, Virginia, when it used to be there. Uh, and then uh, I was part of this army uh, reconnaissance team. And at 21, I was on, in the Green Berets. Very fast pace, fast pace, you know? And um, what I want to tell you is that it, it takes a certain breed to be that. Mm -hmm. And a certain right. expectations that you place on yourself. <clears throat> Literally. Yeah. Standard. Right, that you place on yourself with significance going back to Tony Robbins. So what I'm saying is to be a Marine, you have to have a, a high standard, you know, and then what you're taught in boot camp. So there's there's expectations placed out of you. Right. But we can lose our way in this journey. And for me, it was replicated to 27 country. And I lost myself in the journey because if you see the worst in life, it absorbs you. I don't care what you say. Yeah. You and you're going to numb it either through drinking or you're going to numb it through drugs or you're going to numb it through womenize it, whatever you, whatever your drug is. Yeah. Numb it, right? So the thing was, I had to realize that. You know, right? and, and it goes back to that, that one point that, you know, we said was that realization of what is, what is true. Yeah. And if you lost yeah, your. You're Speaking of Ronin, you ever see the movie Seven Samurai, Akira Kurosawa? Yes, yeah, one of my favorites. One of my favorite films of all time. I was actually a dabbling filmmaker at one point, and they're Ronins, those guys, right, who've lost kind of, because the whole point of a samurai is to serve a, a lord, right, and be part of kind of a clan. And, and Ronin's the one that sort of is a wandering sort of masterless samurai. And yet, through you becoming Ronin, uh, it, it, you you found a new mission, right? You found a, not a war, but a mission and a mission of service, a mission of a legacy and blessing others and mentoring. But, you know, for those listening that are like younger and they're wondering, man, I want to be a samurai, right? Like a Lance Corporal of the Marine Corps who is very motivated, who's 20 years old and, and maybe thinking special forces, maybe thinking something like that. Uh, what did you do when you decided at nine, I'm going to be a samurai, this is the path for me, practically, what changed in your life? Well, first, you have to visualize what a samurai is in this modern day era, right? What is it? It's an ideal. Mm -hmm. It's a code. It's a belief, right? So when people say, well, how can I be a samurai? It starts with the mind, right? Who, who, who do you visualize you are? And then are you willing to take this path? Right. For me, what I what I saw growing up in these special forces was Green Berets are able to force multiply. They're able to go into countries and free to oppress and fight for the people they can't fight for, the free to enslave. So I, I saw that vision. So for me, that that map, that road, that compass bearing was was very, you know, it popped out of me right at a young age. I just had to have enough guts and courage to to shape myself into becoming this. Right. So so that's the thing is like that's what led me down this road to to be this modern day samurai. So if you're asking for, for a young Marine to say, hey, how can I live a life like a samurai? Well, understand what the Bushido code means. You know, understand what the way means and understand history and understand if that ideal fits with you. Right. Because a warrior, look, I, I study Spartans, I study you know, Knights of the Temper, I, I study different cultures as I travel throughout the world. 
And uh, I, I went to the very roots of some of these teachings. I look, I closed out my warriors in, you know, Redondo Cave in uh, Komalto, Japan, where the Book of Five Ring was written by a, a Roman named Moto Masashi. You know, so I traveled the world. What I, I came to realize is that, you know, man, we have to be tied to a higher power. Every, every culture that I've been through to the highest mountains in the Himalayas, they are tied to this higher power, you know? And I don't feel like the military, and when I say the military, it's just my snapshot, right? On the teams, we don't, we don't, fulfill our spirituality side enough mm -hmm. you know but but I'll, i will say you know for two for a sword is if i had look if i had this level of awareness and, and stuff like that i don't know if i could have been who i was yeah so that's the question i would have for you it's looking back at it now what are some things that you think could be institutionalized to to maybe contribute to that to, to the spiritual wellness of warriors you know any warrior right in the past culture and history to have books and you know they've written how they were able to heal themselves i've been into tribal lands in in africa you know where they healed themselves you know through their you know their medicine guys you know and, and mm -hmm. I, like i seen these practices mm -hmm. you know so Spiritual, I mean, spiritual healing, man, is it's it's a journey, it's a path, man. It, you know, and I'm still on it. You know, everybody's like, like you know, how I fooled, you know, others. You know, when I'm staying on the History Channel, and smiling, and I was breaking mm -hmm. inside. You know, people, yeah. I have I have to have the answers. No, no, I don't. But I'm working on it. <laughs> right, I'm working on it every day. Um, yeah, and it, it's getting easier. Right, it's getting easier. So I want to I want to let people know that for me, it's been six and a half years on this journey. Yeah, right. So think about for me. So for me, it's twenty three years in service. So you think I'm going to get better? Just you know, I mean, in in a year, don't don't have expectations. Just understand like there's a discipline. Yeah, there's a discipline to it. So so some Marines, you know, it takes longer for them to develop their cardiovascular on the run. Some Marines are just natural at running. So when you're in this journey, sometimes you'll reach that point faster and, and, and other guys might reach it a little longer. For me, it took a long time because, you know, I, I saw trauma since I was a child, literally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. Go, going back to when you were now preparing for boot camp, I guess when you decided I'm going to be a Green Beret, like this, this motto, this image, this idea lines up with me, with the samurai path. How did you start preparing? Because like you said, it takes a certain kind of person to pass through boot camp selection and all of that. And I know you've had a very illustrious career where you were at the top of your game the whole time. Mm -hmm. So practical advice for Marines who are motivated, who want to be fit, want to get to the next level maybe they want to venture into marsoc or other areas that are more demanding what did you have to do to like take your physical your 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 discipline level to a new new level you know kind of up the yeah the training well at first it starts with mindset right who do you want to be so let's just say you know you, you, for me it was a green brand who you want to be so and and really mean that and then come up with an intelligent timeline so I, I knew I wanted to be a Green Beret literally at 13 years old. It was the Panama War. Um, my, my stepfather deployed, you know, I, I started seeing the real world missions that, you know, they were actually doing, you know, so I was drawn to that and I wanted to be that. So at 16 years old, I remember I, I started uh, strengthening my body. There was a timeline because I knew I had to hit 18. So I started changing my body. You know, look, look, people, they see me, you know, as an athlete now, but I, I tell you, man, I was malnourished as a child. I lived in the refugee camps, right? Mm -hmm. When I came over to America, we were very poor. I, so during the growth years, I was very malnourished, mm -hmm. right? So I, I realized I was so weak at that at 16, right? And I needed strength of my body. 
So it started, look, we didn't have money. We didn't have gym memberships or any of that. I lived in, um, in, a, in a house near the uh, Fort Bragg training area. So my backyard was the Fort Bragg training area. I would run through these woods. I, you know, my mom would bring home rice bags because you know we would eat a lot of rice and I would um, fill it up with sand and that became my weights. I would hoist mm. over trees and that became my bags. So what I'm saying is I wheeled my body into what my image of it should be. And how do you know what it should be unless you're willing to do the research? And my research was going to the library and really studying down on history, right? Mm. Right. How, why was the Green Berets developed? You know, like I, I read these books. There wasn't a lot of information back then because special operations was very secretive back then. Yeah. Right. So uh, I would read what, and in between, I would read about, you know, uh, Confucius. I would read about Taoism. I would read Sanju, Art of War. You see what I'm saying? So you have to have an image. Sure. Yeah. Right. So, okay. So a lot, a lot of, let's say, raiders, right? They come in, I want to be a raider. Okay. And then you get to, let's just say you, you go through all that training, you get to a team. Okay. A lot of, a lot of what I'm saying is a lot of green berets, they, they, they go through all this pipeline training, they get to a team with no really, okay, I just did this because it's cool. Yeah. On purpose, yeah. <laughs> right. It's not purpose. Right. Yeah. Purpose yeah. Is, you know, man, you know, the world's suffering. You know, as a child, I, I watched National Geographic a lot. Right. Mm. I, I was just that kid that was so curious about life. So I saw all these sufferings and all these people. And I'm like, man, if I could be this, this, this soldier, right, that can go and, and help. I just didn't put it all together yet. I didn't realize the special forces goes and, and you know, do demining missions and humanitarian missions. So does the Raiders, you know. So that's that's bigger, that's bigger purpose, right? So what I'm saying is vision. Like I knew I wanted to be this entity that helps the world and the Green Beret was my delivering process. But a lot of guys go, I want to go to the Green Berets because I want to get in gunfights. Yeah. And look, and I was there as in, I want to get in gunfights. Look, it's, it's, you know, I'm sure a lot of, you know, infantry Marines cannot understand what I'm saying is that, you know, when you go in, you want to get test your skills. Mm-hmm. Right. And then, you know, we did, you know, when, when the war years happened, we went in, we tested our skills, but then that multiplied like to 15 years from my career, you know, and at the end I was lost. Yeah. I lost myself because I tell you at the JSOC level, there's a lot of demands on us to perform. You're in a national level. You look, man, there's a lot of expectations placed on us at the command level, at the national yeah. level. Yeah. Imagine living up to those expectations over and then and then you having your own standard. And then, and then when you, you know, for me, when I got out, I, I, I had to be in an image, right? In the Hollywood world, the business world, and the training world. So, man, that's a lot of pressure. It, 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 I guess it kind of crumbled on me. And that's where I found yeah. spirituality because it was crumbling. Like, you know, I was rising. I was right. But spiritually, I was, I was, gosh, yeah, spiritually, I was hurting. Right, my yeah. soul was hurting. And um, and after the Tony Robbins seminar, he gave me a bearing. Yeah. He gave me a bearing now, just like the Green Berets, he gave me a bearing to the teams. Now it gave me my pain and suffering. And then now this just the seed of just the seed, this 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 thought that hey man, I can I can move towards this direction. But when I did it and I sat myself, man, I really met God. Like mm -hmm. I really feel that connection. So what I'm saying is if you sit with yourself, you're going to feel that you're going to feel it. And, 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 and if you're having problems, the answers are there in silence, not, not, Hey mom, what do you think? Hey, 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 you know, to your wife or, you know, whatever. Look, man, you're, if you sit with yourself, you're going to connect with this higher power. And then when, when I went out of Tony Robbins, it gave me a different bearing and that led me to fulfillment and fulfillment is I'm willing to get up in front of 500 police officers now and speak about, you know, speak about, you know, my journey and, and how I chose this higher power, you know? So that led me to fulfillment. You see what I'm saying? It's like my struggles led me to be a Green Beret, right? Because I, I picked a higher power. Yeah. Right. 
Right. A lot of people, they, they, they face trauma and they pick a lower vibration of energy, right? Mm -hmm. Vibration of energy as in, you know, you know, for greed, suffering, jealousy, you're picking that lower vibration. But if you pick a higher vibration of energy, love, compassion, it's going to lead you to a higher power, right? And there's actually, you know, vibrations. There's, you know, in the brain, right? When you, when you, mm -hmm. when you, when you go into love, right, is a higher frequency. If you go yeah. into hate and jealousy, it goes to a lower frequency. Imagine living in that lower frequency, right, every day, then in time, that lower frequency, you know, scientists have, you know, science has proved that it causes, you know, illness. Yeah. You have to live in a higher frequency. Yeah, there's a lot of research on that, of spirituality practice and impact on other areas of life. I mean, the, the research now is very plentiful. And, you know, I take away from this segment that your journey to the path of the samurai, like the vision was the key, right? And it seems like everything else you do too, right? Where that you can, we can learn techniques, we can learn how to get bigger, stronger, faster, but without that vision, you eventually hit that brick wall because the question of the why is wanting. It's like, why am I doing this? What is it for? Where am I going? And it seems like at your core, you always had that burning spiritual quest of the why, who am I? And it's been different versions of you growing uh, in, in different times. So that's, that's super inspiring. And we are coming to the end of this segment, but any uh, parting shots for you uh, too uh, before we end this one and roll into our next one? No, just, you know, understand your why. Right, understand your why in life. And that why should be a powerful why. And that why should be connected to a higher power. So understand your why in life. And when you when you fall, when you fall, because we all do, get back up. Right. Yeah. And that why be your compass bearing. Mm. Awesome. Steve, you have anything? I think one key word was bearing. <clears throat> know what your bearing is. That's what stuck out to me. Um, and we say that a lot, right? What's your true north? What, what's your focus, right? Yeah. And I think that for our listeners, I just want to resonate with that and say, you know, that's that, as two just mentioned, you got to find your why, you got to find your purpose. And, and there's a, plenty of resources to do that, right? Um, for myself, I seek that out through my Christian faith. For some, they seek that out through stoicism. There's a ton of avenues to do that. And so... I uh, just want to be an encouragement to our listeners. Hey, get on the journey. And that ends yeah. this session. Yeah. Hey, folks, welcome back to segment three with Two Lamb. What an awesome uh, time it's been so far. And well, I can't wait to get into segment three. There's so much to uh, pick out wisdom and insights from Two Story. Uh, and on this one, we're going to talk kind of about his experience with mentoring others, as well as being mentored. As we all know, in the military, that's one of the reasons why many people join. We want to work with inspirational leaders. We want to be inspired. And I think that's why the military is such a unique place, right, in society, that it has a creed, it has a code. And we want to see people who live up to those, who embody those. And when we do find them, sometimes that's when we feel like, you know what, I will go to war with this person. I'll go anywhere to the ends of the earth, because at the heart of that military culture is this desire for honor, glory, commitment, courage, and so forth. So tell us about your experience of being mentored in the military. Obviously, you got a mentor in your house. You're, you had a drill sergeant stepdad who mentored you, like it or not. You had an uncle who was also a very... Uh, experienced the seasoned uh, no, uh, special operations uh, an officer, but are there any other mentors or the way they mentored you that stand out as features that really helped you? You know, I, believe it or not, my wife, you know, is, uh, I look up to her a lot these days, you know, um, very, very wise. Uh, she's very, uh, 
something. So it was very strong in mind, you know? So I, I, I pick her brain and how she's able to focus on business um, and, and drive on the way she does, you know? Because being a business owner, um, entrepreneurs, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're facing this business world and she makes some incredible decisions. So her, obviously my mother is one of my, if not my biggest uh, influence next to my wife, my mother, I always ask for strength from my mother, you know, um, very uh, strong willed person, you know, and, and people always ask me, you know, Bushido, when we're like, you know, readily accept death. There's nothing more Bushido than my mother, who's willing to take her two children onto a, a wooden fishing boat, escape in Vietnam, where knowing over 400,000 refugees have died, you know, to place it all on the line, you know? And that's, to me, that's, that's what a warrior is. Are you willing to die for an idea? Speaking of your mother, man, I remember a story where you guys were, I think Malaysia or Singapore, where you're kind of on an island almost, right? In the forest somewhere. And you just kind of left to survive on your own as refugees. And your mother's like going around doing trade to find a way to feed you guys, to take care of you guys and kind of ensure your survival, right? Of like the wealthy folks and their jewelry or something. And she's working with the barbarians <laughs> or the vandals. And I was like, man, what a industrious, resourceful woman. But more than that, you talked about how she would go around giving, you know, food and other things to the neighbors, right? To the other uh, poor communities in your neighborhood in Fayetteville. And you asked her, right? And I mean, what a what a display of compassion at heart that, that your mom showed you. Uh, but in specific ways, how did she kind of serve as a mentor in your life growing up, though, in, in your hard times? You know, in the Special Forces, you know, uh, I fight for the people. So I fight for my mother, compassion. You know, she taught me Confucius at a young age to, to better the world starts with you. So I, I, I willed my body to this weapon now for deploy over these continents in, in some of the most hostile areas in the world. So you're seeing suffering. You're seeing, you know, that at a real level, you know, when, as a child, I saw it at a real level. I was so disconnected, but now you're, you're the free of the oppressed, you know, so that my mother influenced me in compassion, you know, to look at things with a higher power you know because you know she okay so it goes back to that vibration right when, when you when you look at trauma you look at people are you going to judge them you know are you going to compare your you know how you live and your living conditions with i don't know some third world educated you know tribesmen are you going to, are you going to understand you're going to show compassion you're going to help them and you're you know in that little time that you have as a higher power, I don't care what religion you are. So I was taught that at a very early age. So what I'm saying is that multiplied for me, even through my hard times. I went to college because of my mother, fighting wars, graduated top of my class, fighting counter potion campaigns in Cameroon, Africa, you know, because she taught me commitment. She taught me that at a very young age. You know, and she drilled into you something about education, right? <laughs> Which is why you slaved over that degree while being forward deployed. Well, I, I you know, tell you the truth, I didn't care about education. Yeah. Now, how, yeah. Why would you at a young age, right? <laughs> you might be a commando. But I, I, I love my mother. And, you know, what education taught me through the process of going to college, man, I, I just saw things at an at a intellectual level as a college educated level. I'm able to converse. I'm able to speak to you know the higher educated guys in the in the military. I became a special ops guy where I have to brief commanders and you know so it, it gave me that level of confidence. But I really did it because you know my mother, you know. But but also coming out of the other end, it taught me so many other things. Not just being educated, disciplined. It taught me, man, to do stuff that I didn't want to do. And why would you want to type a term paper after? <laughs> Dude, after you just wrote, you know, just wrote on a little bird hitting a target, seeing dead bodies at that level of adrenaline, and now you got to wash, wash your uniform, your you know, your hands from this blood, and then be a college student. Can you imagine? <laughs> that was so hard for me. Yeah, that's so hard for me. You know, that's crazy. Yeah. And too, I remember you told a really powerful story about education, um, and and when you gave a pencil to a young lady 
relay that real quick. Yeah, that's where that compassion thing came in that I saw things at a different level than maybe other team guys did. You know, so uh, we were doing a demining operation in Laos. And, um, you know, being the young Green Beret, I was sent in to kind of set everything up for for the demining ops. So the demining ops, we link up with these villagers. Um, back in the Vietnam War, uh, Americans would drop hundreds of thousands of landmines and rice paddies. And, you know, I mean, kids now they're in the jungle floors, kids that are playing even today, they're, they're uh, you know, they're losing their legs and limbs by stepping on these landmines. So we came in to help um, find, fix these landmines and, and show how to disarm these landmines. So I knew where the minefields was, you know, so I studied and when we touched down in Laos, I remember I was on mission mode, right? And I, I came out and, and my, my linguist came running up to me and we we're walking off the LZ and this little girl, um, you know, she came running out and uh, she she ran up to me, you know, being a, a, a soldier, I'm like, oh, she must want candy or whatever. So I pulled candy. Out. I was prepared, pulled candy out and I gave it to her. And she 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 shook her head and she actually opened up my hand and put the candy back in my hand. And then she said something and I looked at the linguist and he looked at me and he said, do you have a pencil? And I had a pen, right? So I pulled out a pen and she hugged me and kissed me. She was so thankful. She ran off. And you know we're we're uh, we're planning on where the, the mining fields were. So I was really, and look, they're, they there are bandits in that area, right? So you have to have you have to have security up. I was looking at you know where the machine gun positions need to be, where the final protection line, the mortars. Right? I was looking at all this defensive posture, and uh, the linguist kept on looking at me. He asked me. He said, you know, learn lunch. He said, sir, do you know what you've done this morning? I mean, when you gave that girl. The pen and I remember I was looking at the map and I looked up at him and I, I said what you know and he said you gave her an education the only thing that I can think about at that moment was my mother mm -hmm. so we um end up going to you know getting a, a supply of school supplies shipped in air dropped lumber and we were able to build a school and we were able to use our demolition tactics to to have a flowing water we rerouted the water line from the river wow and um and we helped them demine so what i'm saying is man that that mission was one of my that was my first mission but that mission was more fulfilling than any combat any anything yeah yeah anything. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, it makes sense, right? Where in combat, generally you're destroying things, right? And you're able to build a society, build a tribe or a community, build people up. And I remember your quote about you were kind of bitter and angry when you left the military, but you started practicing kindness, right? You, you would just say something nice to the, the grocery clerk or the cab driver, the Starbucks person, whatever. And the more you did it, you said kindness made you happy again. I love that quote so much. I shared it at a staff meeting and the general liked it so much. He was like just kind of repeating it for everybody. <laughs> but it's there's something there, right? Where building up versus tearing down produces something, even at a scientific level, like endorphins and other things. And you talk about frequencies, but at a deeply spiritual level, right? It gives us a sense of real meaningful purpose, doesn't it? And we don't get that opportunity enough in the military. Uh, I remember taking a bunch of Marines. This is one of the highlights of my career. I took a bunch of Marines to an elementary school in Camp Pendleton. I didn't know that this area was like completely gang infested, right? But we went there. It was the weirdest experience of my life where these kids were asking for our signatures. I must have given like 100 autographs on kids like foreheads to their arms everywhere. They stormed us like we were superheroes. And it was mind boggling, but you realize, man, this is how much social poverty there is, right? There's so lack of uh, adult figures and mentors in their lives that when people come in here with these uniforms on that represent the nation's cloth, that for them, this is just an unforgettable moment. And I walked away just feeling so humbled, so grateful, 
and those Marines too. I mean, we had Marines that were from 18 to 30 years old and they all walked away just like never forgetting that experience. So man, that's powerful. Are there other mentors though beyond uh, your mom? And the, uh, she's a powerful, obviously she's probably number one on your list and your wife as well, but others in the military that stand out and maybe some things that they did that you remembered and you're like, you know, I'm going to do that. Or man, that guy really helped me or girl. Well, before I move on to the military, my, my stepfather, obviously my stepfather, discipline, yeah. discipline, discipline, discipline. Uh, he taught me to never give up, right? Never. So, um, but the military, you know, I had a lot of great mentors in the military, a lot, you know, from my, from my drill started. And each mentor came at a certain stage of my life, you know, mm-hmm. uh, my, my drill started, you know, uh, I wanted to be ranger qualified. He was ranger qualified. So he was able to mentor me a little bit. Um, so I, I was able to achieve that, that, you know, that ranger uh, qualification status. And, and for our Marines who don't know what that means, right, in the Army, uh, is that optional? Is that yeah, uh, awesome. something that, that's expected? And, and uh, how hard is it? And what does it mean, right, for your career? You know, Ranger training, you know, students have died. I mean, you're going to, um, they're going to push you. They're going to push you hard. A lot of Marines. Um, there was, in fact, a few Marines that went through my Ranger school class. So a lot of the recon guys back then. Um, it's just a prerequisite in special operation, as in nobody's going to tell you to do it. Right. But it just shows you how much intestinal fortitude you have. Right. You, you, you know, for me, we ate one meal a day. You're burning. It's like hell week. Right. You're burning, you know, 4,000, 5,000 like hours that you're getting one hour of sleep. You know, they're pushing you and you're do, doing live fire exercises, you know, and you're getting great in these leadership positions. Um, officers in the infantry, that's a prerequisite, you know. Um, okay. okay. For, for us, it wasn't, but I, I went to that training when I was 19. And I tell you, at 19, it was very difficult, right, for me, because I yeah. the maturity level at that age to to walk or die, literally to walk or die. You know, guys were getting heated, Josh, and I felt like I was going down. Uh, I want to put you on this day, Ranger School. We were force marching. I was in a new pair of, uh, of jungle boots because I wanted to break them in there in this room. That's how dumb I was, right? I had no skin on the bottom of my foot by the time this. I was oh, dehydrated. I, I was going down, right? You know, and uh, I remember uh, I said to myself, you're, you're about to pass out. I remember like I was falling asleep, walking. And um, the ranger instructor came back and he goes, ranger, if you fall one more step behind, I want to pull you from the training. And I literally at that point, I punched myself in the face. And, you know, I like punched my, and I, at the end <laughs> of that, that I, I, my nose is bleeding, my eye, I punched <laughs> myself in the face, right? And I remember the first time I punched myself in the face, the ranger instructor looked at me. He goes, drive on, ranger. And, he, <laughs> away, right? and I, I punched, and I realized, man, like, I was on the border of heaters, like I was going down. Yeah. But that's the thing, man, it's like in 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 training and in, in anything, in anything you do, you have to be willing to give it all, right? And 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 understand that sometimes you're gonna maybe lose your way, right? Because life life is hard, and and you know, especially during the war years, you're gonna you're gonna lose your way. So it's about kind of reflecting, understanding who you want to be right and look how many times in land navigation have we we stopped right took our bearings again opened up the map replotted making sure and then reconfirming the asthma right how many times yeah, that's great. And, um, and that's what i did you know i uh, after i got out of the military was i took a knee i drank water and, and basically reflected and uh, I took a different asthma because my image of who I want to be was different from who I want to be in the military. Yeah. I I would imagine while you were in in service, you were probably an amazing mentor tactically because of all your vast training and experience, but were you able to mentor others at at a deeper level too? Uh, So in terms of you mentoring others, do you have any examples? No, I mean, when I was in the military, it was more of tactics, strategy, mission, operations. Sure. Yeah, yeah, just stuff that I'm really good at um, on the teams, 
we're we're high we're we're high intensity. So I, I would mentor in physical training. I would mentor yeah. uh, in long uh, physical training sessions. Got endurance. Uh, hand to hand combat was my thing. Right. So yeah. uh, I was highly trained in it, and um, that's what I mentor. But what I'm saying is, like looking back, there was no balance. Yeah. Yeah. I had the balance. I had so much fire and I had so much drive and all that, but there was no like God, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fighting for it. You know, like what I'm saying is I was fighting for this higher compassion. That's tied to God. I was, you know, I was I was free and oppressed. That's tied to God because that's higher purpose. You're you're helping others. But I wasn't my relationship wasn't there. Yeah. And I didn't even know what that meant. So like I, I remember guys saying, Oh, you know, I have great relationship with God you know because you meet different religions right in the military right and um a lot of you know I'm Christian these days but you know back then a lot of them were like I'm, I'm tied to him I hear him I'm like wow you're an angel because mm. I, I didn't have that mm. you know I yeah I like how you tied your your former times as like you were just this fire like fire was the only energy you had and so while it's indispensable, we need fire. It, it, it warms us, it illuminates, it does a lot. But if that's our only way of operating, we burn the things that we care about too, right? <laughs> and I, I guess over time, the balance is learning to adjust the fire as well as uh, embodying different energy too, right? Yeah. And you and Mark, as you talk about relationship, I got I got to ask this question. I've been dying to ask it. Just wait for the moment to jump in. Um, to you mentioned your, earlier in this conversation, your wife and how powerful she was uh, to you. And I just want to ask, num, number one, how many years have y'all been married? Um, so I know it's been a while. Um, but then also, too, what's the what have been the the things that you would look back and say this is what made our marriage last? Um, what's the secret sauce, if you will? Uh, we've been married over 20 years. Um, yeah. She was there oh. since the beginning of my special operations, literally, career. Um, you know, man, what I'm going to tell you is this. You know, when I first came into this marriage, you know, when you're young and you're aggressive, it's, it's literally all about you. Right. <laughs> you know, any, yeah. Anything, like, especially military, I want you to think about this because I want you to, this could save your marriage, right? You know how many times we move in the military. You know, for me, special operations. When I got to a certain point in in uh, the tier level, I didn't have to move anymore. But before then, we move every three years, three to four years. Well, you know, and sometimes we move overseas. So what I'm saying is, like, she had to give up her career to move with me. And you know, at that point in my life, it it is what it is. You know, what I mean, like, it was all about me, right? You know, and when I went through many, many hours, like I was gone a lot. We were gone 10 months out of the year, and especially at height of war, at the level I was fighting, we were highly demanded, you know, especially in reconnaissance. So when I'm saying reconnaissance is if I had to go into a country, I couldn't communicate with her. I couldn't talk to her unless I was in a skiff area where I had to be in around, you know, secured, you know, and that's at the embassy. And we're living in these safe houses in, I don't know, in the middle of town, hunting down bad guys. So it was very hard for me to communicate with her too. Mm -hmm. So I, I think back now, I think back in my whole career, she gave up, she just gave up her whole life for me, you know, moving from one location to the next, you know, uh, worrying about me, you know, times of war, you know, so, but it was all about me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until literally when I found God, uh, uh, <laughs> saying that it's when I found God was when I started looking at things differently. And it started with uh, choosing a higher power, compassion, right? So now I've looked at, wow, she gave us so much for me. So obviously I'm, I'm at a point in my life that I realized that I'm waking to that so I can commit for the rest of my life and trying to fix that, right? Right. But that's, I guess that was the biggest thing is like in the military, you can get so caught up on yourself and you think the universe revolves around you. 
you know? And I'm not saying that, you know, you're right or wrong, obviously it's wrong, but I'm not saying you're wrong for feeling that way because we're all humans, right? And, and, and that's, that's part of learning and making mistakes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess like for me, it was, it was just that, it was like, you know, the marriage, you know? And then her looking back now is, man, she put herself through a master's degree program while I was still working to support our, our, our income because, you know, as an enlisted guy, you know, you don't get paid that, that much, you know? So she supported that and she went to school and graduated with honors with a master's degree. And then she went into the business. So I'm very proud of her, Yeah, but I wasn't really present, um, you know, when I was younger because it was all about me. Right. Did you ever ask her why she stuck around or <laughs> kind of, <laughs> Yeah, she always believed in me, man. Mm. You know, wow. she always, even to this day, you know, even when uh, I was lost, you know, she believed in me. She never had wow. anything else. That's powerful. Yeah. And in fact, she never uh, saw me as a weak person. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's crazy because, you know, here I am, I'm bawling, I'm throwing <laughs> up for a place, you know. Um, yeah. And she never saw me as a weak person. Well, I can say for myself, you know, um, over 20 years of marriage, I think we've come from 28 years now. Um, but I, I think three words stick out at me. One is commitment, right? Obviously, you guys are committed to one another. Like that, and that's just it. You know, and she was, that sounds like her commitment to you was just through the roof, right? Uh, she believed in you and, and, and that's huge, right? In, in today's culture, uh, we see so many, couples that don't have that level of commitment or this happens or that happens in their relationship degrees so that that's amazing and it's a powerful testimony your story reminds me of I, i've no, i've talked to a number of team guys who some actually had a full team career active duty and served the teams as a civilian and they're looking we're talking about like 30 40 years right and they come to me and they're like chaps i I've been working for this moment to retire with my wife, but she doesn't want to have anything to do with me. I don't know what to do. Like everything I've done was for this. And now I don't have anything. And so now I, we've, we've had some happy endings there too, where they, they go to some intensive kind of, you know, marriage workshops and really rebuild that marriage. But it's what you said, right? When you're in the teams, it's teams first and then family second. And it, it, it almost demands that, right? Especially at the tier level where you can never have a bad day. You can never have a bad day. And to be on like that all the time, to be hypervigilant, even the, the daily kind of relaxation of, hey, your family barbecue, you could feel like, oh, this is going to loosen me up. I got to stay tight. I got to stay, you know, just prepared. You, you, I think you retired as an E9, right? So Sergeant Major or, or Bass Sergeant? Or yeah, I medically retired as an E9. Yeah, so you were in the senior ranks of the Army Special Operations. So, you know, we work at headquarters, right? And we, we interface with a lot of leadership. I'm curious, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to those things that some of it is age, right? Like, I don't know if we can make an 18-year-old Marine just all of a sudden grow mature with an easy button. There is no easy button for that. So they got to live life a little bit. But what, what do you think are things that we can do better? Right, uh, as a DOD, to help maybe younger, uh, you know, service members, kind of maybe balance that out a little better. What are some things that come to mind that stand out for you for those who actually can affect change right now? You know, I I, I think back to when I was eighteen. You know, it's it's very hard to see it back then. You know, it's it, if especially if you're driven uh, with fire like I did, it's very hard to see. But if I, if I was to say, you know, you have to put the mentors up as in guys that the young Marines or young soldiers look up to that they're like, man, I want to be that guy. Right. So you put those guys up on the podium and you let them be the face for these young Marines because the young Marines have to want to be that guy. They have to have that image. Right. OK, this guy is really successful. Right. He. He owns this company. He was, he had this amount of military experience. Like, 
you know, for me as a young soldier, it was about war. It was about combat. It was about, you know, that experience. So you have to be able to put somebody up that can talk to a young guy at that level and understand that level of energy or talk to a, I don't know, a 38 year old that now he's at the end of his career, he's lost with no purpose. And maybe he's going through some trauma with combat or a agency guy who got out and now he's a contract for ground branch working, you know, for a paramilitary for, and then he, he's stuck in his job that he's been doing for close to 45 years, just chasing bad guys. Fire, mm. you know, yeah. fire, fire. Yeah, so, yeah. Burn me, right, fire is what destroy me in the end. So I, I guess I could say that you have to be able to put guys up that's kind of, can be a mentor to all these levels. Right. Mm -hmm. And the young ones, you have to understand fire. You have to understand. Yeah. I, I get it at your age, but understand that this is what happened to me. Right. And then let them make the decision. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you have a lot of fans, even in the game call of duty world. That was how I was selling your podcast to my kids. I got three teenage boys and then the seven year old daughter. Right. So, man, I won't be empty nesting for a long time. And I've been telling them, hey, you got to check out his story. It's like better than a movie. And he's a character in the game. And I was just hoping they will pick up some of your wisdom, some of your life lessons, take them to heart. I got two juniors and a freshman right now, all boys with pretty much, you know, fire and, you know, <laughs> not much else. So what, what do you tell teens? Like, you know, younger kids, right, who are like, Maybe where you were, uh, at, you know, living in Fort Bragg and going through uh, the, the teen questions of identity, like, okay, how am I going to be this samurai? How am I going to be a Green Beret? What, what do you tell them who are still trying to figure out their way? You know, my, my image of who I want to be came to me in my weakest moment. It was my defeated moment. And this image or this philosophy or this, this gave me a seed, or you can call it a spark, right? It, it gave me fire, like fire to be this better person, right? So in life, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to who you want to be, right? And understand this purpose may change through the evolutions of your life. But the things that don't change is your morals, right? Your code and how you wish to live. So when people are like, I want to be the samurai, it's not about, you can be a samurai in my eyes with the same ideals and be, a cook right because mm. they're if they're focused on the moment they they live by code and work ethics and they're tied into higher power by serving others through their food and their creation how is that different from a warrior who harnesses a skill set to serve others right so that's the image guys it's the image you have to understand that vision right sometimes you may lose that vision but what was the code that brought you into that vision I feel like if you sit with yourself, so in the, in, in the teachings of Zazen and mindfulness, they talk about heaven and earth. And within heaven and earth, there's a space and the humans walk the space in heaven and earth. And if you sit with yourself, it was heaven that plants these visions because humans make the, the vision happen. So if heaven wants you to free to oppress, you'll have this vision whatever that universe, you know, that environment, that, that situation allow you have this image. And it's up to you as a human being through your morals and your character and your physical training, your sacrifices to wield yourself into what is a vision, into reality, right? So what made you wanna to, want to be a chaplain, right? Help others, something gave you that image, something gave you that calling. Well, for me, the calling was oppression. It was, you know, suffering. It was all of this. And I got tired of being this weak human being. And there was a vision placed in front of me. Right. And because that vision was given to me through Bushido and the warrior and the samurai idol and all these philosophies that came with it, it led me down a certain direction because I had an image of who I wanted to be. Right, so if you don't have an image you, you want to be, then you blindly walk through the land navigation course. You never get there. Yeah. So first, it starts with an image. Second, it starts with intelligence. You know, Lao Zhu, a philosopher of Taoism, he was the founder of Taoism. 
He said, you know, a journey of a thousand miles began with a single step. You know, that's so simple. That is so rooted, right? Because that first step has to start with courage. That first has step has to start with vision, planning, right? Or you blindly walk. So that first step is everything. And that first step can only be done if you have a vision of who you want to be, right? So have a vision, have discipline, and understand that if you want to be great at anything, if you want anything great in life, you're, you're going to have to suffer. Yeah. You're going to have to suffer. And you're <laughs> going to have to face failures, right? And through failures and suffering, it teaches you commitment. Are you, are you willing to get back up after failing? If you fail at something and the world mocks at you, laughs at you, are you willing, are you willing to continue to step forward? Walk your own truth, right? So that takes a lot of courage. Right? Yeah. So it takes vision. It takes, you know, courage to walk it and it takes discipline. What, what, what is your level of discipline? And, and discipline employed in the wrong direction it's just like walking in the wrong direction i don't care you get up at four o'clock in the morning people tell me too i get up at four o'clock in the morning i do everything you say and i'm still fucked up <laughs> yeah it doesn't follow us in with your idea who are you mm. i'm just a hillbilly redneck with this i'm telling you because i teach everywhere right yeah 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 I teach too many many students yeah, <laughs> I said, that's, that's why you blindly walk because you'll have a vision who you want to be. Well, I want to be a chief of this state. And I said, that's not who you want to be. That's a status. Yeah. 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 Why do you want to be a chief? To serve my community, to, to be a mentor to solve. That's more of a purpose to me than to fulfill a status, right? So it's vision mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's discipline. It's discipline to, to do the things that needs to be done even when you don't want to do it. You know, look, I didn't want to get up before. I still don't want to get up before I talk anymore. In fact, Tony Robbins, he gets up and the first thing he does, he walks in his backyard, he jumps into a cold plunge, 65 degree water. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Just getting out of bed, getting naked, running in the back, jumps in, and then resets his system. Wow. So <laughs> what I'm saying is that, you know, sometimes we can get lost and you need to reset your system. You need to reset your ideals. What worked for you in one evolution may not work for you in others. You know, uh, kindness is weakness and on teams. It is. Kindness yeah. is we're, we're taught that in training, replicated through multiple years of training. So that became a real thing for me. Yeah. When I, when I was lost and I, I found out I wasn't kind anymore, I can't even socialize with people. I realized that's not who I want to be. So that, yeah. vision, that vision came out, I want to be kind. So I'm going to explain this. How can you be kind, right? So I'm like, okay, I've got to be kind again. I'm not that kind of a person. So I would literally go to, uh, you know, if I go to the door of my wife and I'll, I'll talk to the talk to the cash register girl. How are you doing? Was, you know, I just want to let you know it's a beautiful day outside. I know you're working in here. So I want to let you know it's a beautiful day. And how, how is your day going? And they'll, they'll, they can come at me like you're a fucking freak or they can come at me, <laughs> wow. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I had a vision of who I wanted to be. And after a year of doing this, opening up the door, being kind and being really aware of that, I became kind. So that can be replicated through anything, anything in your life. Business to being a, a Marine, a Raider, to be, you know, the best human being you can be, right? That's, that's really the, the, the secret to life, right? is to be the best person you can be. I could see the t-shirt uh, and I will give you this for free, but you should, the acronym, right? Maybe in the back, uh, it could be V for vision, I, V kid, right? V K for kindness, I for intelligence and D for discipline. Okay. <laughs> There's a t-shirt right there uh, <laughs> with the Ronin title, with the branding. <laughs> Speaking of which, you gotta let me know where I can order one of those sweats, uh, hoodies, man. Those are sick. Uh, I'm gonna rock that for the next one. But as we come to a close, man, to this has been just a sheer privilege. What a, what an awesome uh, experience to hear your story from a slightly different angle than the ones I heard, and also to meet you even better. So, 
just thank yeah. you so much for your time today. And I think as a dad of three teens and also, you know, as you know, the military is mainly 25, 18 to 25 year olds. Yeah. And I think for that generation, and I think you don't have any kids, right? Uh, as far as I remember hearing that. So, but I know you're all about service and giving back. I think some kind of camp for the younger crowd that you run that incorporates mind, body, spirit training, man, will be off the chain. I would sign on my kids and I would send them to you for a month. <laughs> it's funny you say that. We run a thing called Ninja Camp. Where Ninja I, Camp. I in, yeah, I bring in and I, I teach Bushido the mind and body. And then I go to meditation. I go to Zizen and then weapons training, knives, hand to hand, blades, pistol, guns. Oh, you know, so that, that's, that's really popular in one of our training curriculums. Okay. I'm going to look that up. Is that on your website? Yes, but it's it's usually sell out, and you know, once we throw it on there, within minutes, it's it's gone. Okay. So, so, how do people get a hold of you or find you know get more information about what you're doing? Yeah, so IG um, uh, on Instagram, Ronin Tactics, Facebook, Ronin Tactics, and you can see us on our website at uh, www.roninTactics.com, and especially our YouTube. Um, that's where I share a lot of my teachings and philosophies. Wow, what a interview, what a story. Yeah. Man, Steve, what what'd you think? What what stays with you about two story? Well, I'll tell you what just really stuck out of me was well, first of all, just how awesome it was for him to be able to tell some more of his story. Um, and hear him say that really it's only been recently in life that he's been able to open up, right? And talk about some of this aspect of who he was. Yeah. You know, that's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. So um and, and what I want to definitely wrap up and say is for our listeners is that, you know, everyone who joins the military and people outside the military that, that haven't done that, but every one of us comes from a background, right? We have the influences that shape us. And we saw that on that spiritual fitness model that we showed in episode one of this podcast. You know, we all have background. We all have influences, things that have impacted us, our parents, how we grew up, our, our culture we grew up in and what made us who we are. Um, and so we might find ourselves on that journey. And if you're not on the journey, my encouragement is get on that journey. Mark, you've been on that journey. I know you and I have talked about that. Um, I know I have. And, and I loved hearing how Tu talked about how he got to that place where he realized I need to get up, I need to do something and figure myself out to get to a place of peace uh, and who he is and connection with purpose uh, for his life. Um, and so, uh, and so he talked about the way, right, in, in the path, right? And it reminded me of this morning when I was uh, driving with the, with the navigation app. And the navigation app gave me an alternate direction to get around an accident. And I didn't know that accident was there, but the, the, uh, the, the phone did, right? And uh, so looking to something uh, beyond yourself or capacity to get on that path and that journey, um, I thought that was just a powerful thing that he shared. Yeah, you know, the, the listeners may think it was intentional, but I, I didn't realize how much he would continue to highlight his spirituality as, as kind of the key, right? That was uh, going to help him unlock balance, unlock compassion, and kindness, and, and humanity, right? And the things that made him lethal as a Green Beret is also what made him terrible as a, a normal human being. And I think in the Marine Corps is the same, right? Because the Marine Corps as a service is probably the one that resembles the most the ethos of the special operations kind of world, right? Where it is, it, ha it has the higher standards, is always pushing itself. And, and every Marine comes in believing they can do anything. They can, right? Like with the crappiest equipment, <laughs> they can do anything. And so if you believe in that, eventually... Uh, it translates to success in an operational setting, but relationally, it could sometimes be a handicap. And he just highlighted those experiences so well. So, man, what a powerful story. Can't wait to have him on the show again sometime, maybe in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Get a chance to uh, catch up with him later down the road. Yeah. Hey, listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. And we are continuing to grow as hosts and as a podcast. Uh, please uh, stick with us and we will bring in more interesting guests uh, and we'll continue to deliver uh, great stories and powerful insights to resiliency. Thanks.
This concludes another episode of the Zero to 100 podcast. Thank you all for listening. And until next time, be strong, be courageous.